Okay, I hope you can all see. Um, when we chose this title, The Anxiety of Inclusion, some people said, that sounds interesting, but what does it mean? So this is an attempt to show you the kind of thing we have in mind. And there are three loosely connected ideas of anxiety that we are concerned with. First of all, there's the anxiety to get into something, to get into a social group or into a country. To get into a country, a club, a university, a circle of friends, a gang. I want to be a member. Then there's the anxiety where you want to get out. You might want to get out from prison, from the country you are in, from a set of family relationships where you feel trapped, from your job, from a particular categorization as a certain kind of person. For example, well, no, I won't give an example now. From a particular construction of your identity, from a particular self-image, perhaps one that traps you, or from the conformist pressures of society. And finally, there's anxiety where you are not sure where you are, or perhaps who you are. You're not sure because your circumstances do not fit those of the prevailing group. You feel you belong and you don't belong, and you are unsteady about this. You don't identify sufficiently with the prevailing, the dominant values and expectations. Okay? I'll say a little more in a minute about this. So, I want to draw attention to you, draw your attention to a connection between the idea of inclusion and the very idea of a limit and of definition itself. So if I say this is a bottle, I can only say it's a bottle and mean it's not a cup, it's not a bowl, it's not something else, it's not a table. So always when we define something, when we use a word, there are limits on what it can mean. For something to be red, it must not be green, and so on. Meaning depends upon there being limits to what words and thoughts refer to an inclusion and an exclusion. Now, animals have a sense of belonging and not belonging, but it's not generated in the same way. Mostly it concerns matters of physiology. For example, they know the smell of each other and they stay with that smell, they share that smell. Or common behaviour, for example, when lions hunt together. We have some of those aspects, but human beings depend more upon symbolic systems, upon names we give ourselves. First names, proper names, calling names, for example. Names you're given when you're born. The name of a university. Symbolic systems then, functioning through language, are crucial for feeling inside or outside as a human being. If you feel Japanese, that's partly to do with the language that relates to Japan. It's partly to do with the name of Japan. It's not just the landmass by itself. And we'll come back to these questions of language later. Okay, so let me go to illustrate some of the ideas we talked about earlier on. The first of the three areas I referred to, the first of the kinds of anxiety, was where we want to get into something. So let's suppose we want to get into Europe. Obviously this is very topical because there have been huge migrations from Syria and from other countries where there's much suffering, where people have tried to move into Europe. 
So that's a scene from somewhere in France where people are wanting to get across the sea and into the United Kingdom. Mostly because of the belief in good social services, good opportunities in the United Kingdom. And this place, like a prison, is where I think 7,000 people were held, were kept there by the French police waiting to see if they could get permission to come into the UK. And some of them took desperate measures to try to get into the UK, hiding under a lorry to travel the journey. And even more desperate circumstances in the Mediterranean Sea, I think about uh, 10,000 people have died this summer, sorry, in the, not this summer, in the last two or three years. About 10,000 people have died trying to get into Europe from North Africa or other countries. And into the United States, well, there was a great concern for people from Europe to get into the United States in the 19th century. And the United States, you can see, was controlling the numbers that came in. And can you guess where that is? Obviously, that's recent. Can you guess where that is in relation to the United States? Mexico. Yes, Mexico. Okay. Okay. But those people probably won't get in because of this. If it ever gets built, Donald Trump, <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump, of course, um, kept saying he would build a fence all the way along the border. And this is um, recent experience for some of us because this is getting into Japan. And you're familiar with these stages one goes through. And if you answer the right questions and your fingerprints are OK, then you can see Fuji once you get there. So of course, this is uh, what happens in many countries. Control of borders, limiting who comes in. We could say much more about Japan, talking about anxieties of influence during the period of closure from 1600 to 1868. And then with the Meiji Restoration at that time, anxieties about how the country would change. If you look at graphs of how the, there's been an increase of people coming into Japan from other countries, the numbers now is far greater than it was. And so you get new anxieties about how traditional Japanese culture will change, as you know. Okay, so wanting to get out, anxieties about wanting to get out. Can you guess where that is? North Korea. North Korea. No. No. Okay. Yes, okay, so this is not now, this is the time of the Berlin Wall, all right, which divided Germany. And many people tried to escape from Eastern Germany into Western Germany and at that time, uh, many people were killed in, do, in the process. And as you say, Nami, this is North Korea, it's a story of someone who did escape to South Korea. These people in the 19th century are slaves. So they're in the United States, but they are trapped in a particular role which they would like to get out of. In the United States, and in England, and in Japan, there are political prisoners, although they may not be recognized as such. And so, of course, there are campaigns to let people out of those circumstances which confine them in those spaces. Now, what does that suggest to you? How could that relate to an anxiety that makes you want to escape or get out? Yes, it's Magritte the Belgian surrealist painter from early 20th century. So what does that make you feel about the country that that depicts? Just conformity. conformity, okay? A life where you dress in an, a suit for the office and you conform with everyone else. Your life is suspended. And in the morning when you put your suit on, you choose which mask to wear. So you're trapped in an inauthentic existence. 
This is by a, a Polish surrealist painter called Morski, I believe. And I won't say much about it, but you can see the powerful image of feeling burdened by the society that you are in. You're burdened by it, you have a weight on you, and you're hollowed out by it, you're emptied by this life you have. And this is a sculpture by the French um, sculptor, Louise Bourgeois. And she makes several sculptures of staircases that lead nowhere. You go up the staircase and you cannot get out. Powerful images of a kind of confinement which you want to escape. There's another one by her, a famous one, a huge spider, much, much bigger. Well, you see people underneath. And this is outside the Tate Gallery in London. And the spider gives a kind of surreal representation of the pressure that you're under. It's a little bit like Kafka's story as well, Metamorphosis. And finally, do you know where that is? <laughs> yes, that's right. So, can you explain, Adrian? Um, just briefly. Uh, Thoreau um, decided to live in the in the wilderness in Concord, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, I think this is. It looks like the wilderness. I think in reality, he was only a, a mile away from. Um, other people, but to live a very sort of self-sufficient kind of life. And, you know, just to, to find, was it about finding what was authentic, what was real in his life, or was that pushing it too far? Uh, it's probably going to more detail than we need, to, but, but um, he, you're completely right to say that he lived only a mile, two kilometres, from the town because he found the town dead. He found it too conformist, and he wanted to give an example of how we might live differently. So he wanted to get out of the society as it was, but not to escape completely, because he wanted to change that society. And we'll be saying a bit more about Thoreau later on. Right, attitudes to others, our attitudes to others. Let's just think about this. We have anxieties about particular types of people getting in to the places or the country or the institution. So of course, Brexit, I think you know what Brexit is. This is the short name for the UK's decision to leave Europe. Brexit is partly based on anxiety about people from Italy or from Romania or from Bulgaria or from other countries coming into the UK and, quotes, taking our jobs. I think you know the, the psychology. Many nationalist movements are based on that. So we're worried about, or people are worried about others getting into our country. Perhaps we're worried about people getting into our family. Perhaps I'm worried about who my daughter marries if she marries someone from a different religious background. Perhaps I'm worried if it's someone with a different skin color. Perhaps I'm worried if she marries a woman. All sorts of things might cause me anxiety. About people getting into our social circle because we don't want to be with them and that will change our social circle or our gang if they come into it and perhaps worry about who gets into your university. And probably you'll recognize that, except for CASA, this is the gate of Kyoto University. <laughs> and behind the wonderful tree in the middle is the building we were in on Friday, the clock tower building. So of course, there's an anxiety not to let people get into Kyoto University if they can't do their study, if they can't do their work at an appropriate level. And there are careful entrance tests to try to control that. 
Now note that this is not just an animal defense of our territory. It's not just looking after ourselves physically. All of these things in the list depend upon the institutions, the institutions of a country. Remember, it's not just a land mass. Of a family, also an institution. Of a social circle, a club, a society, a gang, and of course, a university. And institutions, human lives basically, depend upon symbols. They depend upon words by which we name things and include something here and exclude it there. Right? And how do we do that? We do that by repeating these names, by opening the university year, by setting examinations, saying that students have passed, having degree ceremonies, and so on. These are performative things we do. We do them in language. They couldn't be done otherwise. We need some symbol system to do that. When I say language, of course, this is language too. Gesture is language. It's all part of our ways of symbolizing meaning. But last night I had a dream. And this is true. So last night when I was thinking about the course, fell off to sleep and then went into this dream. And the dream was that I was in a meeting with a number of people a little bit like this. And it was a meeting with people who were professors of philosophy and they were arguing about whether certain kinds of philosophy, so-called, counted as philosophy. For example, is Thoreau a philosopher? Is this kind of work acceptable as philosophy? So this was an argument about inclusion and exclusion. We can't have that person because they're specializing in Thoreau. We can't have that person because they're specializing in Fromm, and Fromm was a psychologist. Do you understand? It's an argument about what can be included and what is to be in excluded. It's typical of many disciplines. Aren't you impressed that I was doing preparation for the class even when I was asleep? <laughs> and that is the entrance to the philosophy building, the uh, philosophy department at Harvard University which now can as well. And can you see how the architecture, these, are they Doric column, columns? This is Greek style architecture and it has a sort of Roman grandeur, this building. And it says, this is important. We are inside, you are outside until you do the right kind of work. So language definition and human being I said the definition always works with an inside. This is a bottle, it's not a table. Okay, there's an inside and an outside. It's a bottle, it's not a cup or a jug. So let's say some more about how this relates to human being. Well, Thoreau, I'm going to say his name again, talks about the way language cuts and divides our thinking. And Thoreau gives a description very careful description of the way that he hoes the ground. These instruments the people are using are called hoes and they make a line in the ground, they split the ground and then you put seeds in the ground. That's what Thoreau did when he lived in his hut. And this would be, I guess, from that sort of time, this image. So the process of sowing seeds is a bit like the process of creating meaning by cutting and dividing. By saying cup, by saying bottle, I've marked this off and separated other things. Animals don't do that. And when you were given a name, an individual name, that also had a process of cutting and defining, limiting you from others. We don't have individual names for the birds in the trees. We don't think of them with a personal identity as we do human beings. That's an Eastern picture of something similar. I don't know exactly what. And those are the lines that are made in the ground, almost like lines of writing. Okay. And later, Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas, someone said, you're interested in Levinas? Okay, 
Levinas, interest in Levinas. So um, Levinas talks about the violence of language precisely because of what I've said. That by saying bottle, I focus attention here and I leave everything else out. Okay, there's a certain violence to that. And we experience this when someone dominates a conversation and they keep on imposing what they want to say in the conversation and excluding other possibilities. It's worth thinking of religious practices too, which of course involve symbols and signs and where there is a separation of what is sacred and what is not where sacred words are generated but also taboo words, words you cannot say. Another kind of symbolism of a non-verbal kind is what we experienced yesterday when we went to Kodaiji and of course you take off your shoes at certain points and that's completely natural in Japan because in your own homes there'll be a place where you take your shoes off and then walk in bare feet or in your socks otherwise. So that kind of separation then, symbolic separation, inside, outside, it's crucial to the human. And it's particularly marked in Japan in that way. So the performative aspects of language affects or brings about inclusions and exclusions. And if you think of the way we talk to one another, then, especially in English, I think in Jap Japanese too, when you hear someone speak, you can probably tell whether they come from Nagasaki, Fukuoka, or, Nagasaki, sorry, or from Hokkaido. I imagine the accent is different. And in, again, in English more than in, 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 in the UK, more than in Japan, when someone speaks, you have an immediate sense of their social class as well. Okay. And then, of course, the topics we address will bring a certain group together, but keep others out. And in many social circumstances, people, people stay with safe topics. Perhaps they avoid politics, for example. Perhaps they avoid religious controversies. And that's one way in which we can feel comfortable together. I don't think it's a good way, but it's one way in which we can feel comfortable together. So, I, we're getting near to the end now, but I want to say something about anxiety as inherent in the human condition. That means anxiety as a necessary part of the human condition. And also that if anxiety is inevitable in the human condition, then is there a tendency to evade it, to avoid it, to run away from it? And the perhaps obvious source of this thought is the philosophy of the 20th century, early 20th century philosopher Martin Heidegger, 1889 to 1976 are his dates. And in Heidegger's uh, book Sein und Zeit, Being and Time from 1927, he talks about anxiety as a main aspect of the human condition. Because the human condition is one where we say we're at home, we talk about being at home, and someone earlier on, I think Marinette, talked about feeling at home in coming to Japan because of your mother, Marinette. But at the same time, do you not feel sometimes that even in your own home, you feel not at home? There's something strange about it. Or it's not quite like it used to be. So you have a sort of nostalgia for what you imagine it was like before. Because home changes and we change all the time. So there's something unheimlich, the German word, word and that's got 
It's kind of got home in the middle, you can see, hasn't it? Unhomely, in a sense. And we can think of that as strange, or the nice Scottish word meaning uncanny, which can mean um, a little bit like a Hitchcock film, an Alfred Hitchcock film where something strange happens, something's not right. And as I've said, it's a bit like being not at home. And so Heidegger will say that this inevitably causes a kind of anxiety, the feeling that things aren't quite right. They aren't quite like it is in the adverts on television. It's always a bit different in reality. It's not like it is in the soap programmes on TV. So it introduces a kind of angst, which is the word in German. And partly this is because although animals die and we die, animals are not aware of their finitude, of their death, in the way that we are. And what Heidegger's got in mind here particularly is not the intellectual awareness of your death, which you all have, we all have right now. We all know we're going to die, but we're not terribly worried about it right now, I guess. Whereas in the middle of the night, sometimes you wake up and you have this sense of being alone and of the fact that at some time in the future, you will be nothing, or at least you'll be nothing in the way that you know now. So for Heidegger, that reality is there. And if we live well, we face up to that. Of course, many people don't face up to it. Most of us, most of the time, don't really face up to it. So we hide from this anxiety in various forms of inauthenticity. And inauthenticity often takes the form of conformism. Conformity or conformism, we do what the others do. If I do what they do, I'll be all right. If I stay with them, no one will notice. If I go with them, I'll know what to do. All of those would be expressions of a conformity in thinking. If I say the same thing my friend says, I'll be okay. If I say the same thing the teacher says, I'll be okay. Now those are evasions or avoidances of living authentically. And about a hundred years before Heidegger was writing these things, Emerson, slightly older than Thoreau, but also part of that same tradition in New England, Emerson had similar thoughts because he talked about his aversion to conformity. And aversion means turning away from. Version, the V-E-R-S means turn and the A means away. Turning away from conformity. He thought we needed to avoid conformity if we're to live well and if we're to lead lives of self-reliance. He has an essay called Self-Reliance. And finally, uh, two of you talked about work on Derrida. Adrian also does work on Derrida. Um, and I know you, Jay, you studied Derrida in your undergraduate degree in Australia. So, and several of you have um, studied Cavell too. So in both Derrida and Cavell, there is a strange idea. It's the idea that our relation to our language, misprint, um, relation to our language is not simply one of possession. So, you know, I have a car, I have a family, I have a house, I can say things like that. And commonly I'll say that my language is English. I use the possessive form, my language is English. But Derrida says, there's something wrong about this. It's not something that I simply have. To think of it is a mistake. Heidegger gives us the idea that in fact we come out of language. Language isn't something we take and use, like we take a computer and use it. Rather, it's from language that we come into human being. Because without language, you wouldn't have any of the thoughts that you now can have. Language is fundamental to those thoughts. Without language, you would be much more like an animal or a machine or whatever it was that enabled you to survive. Our coming into the world is a coming into language. 
But our words can also be strange to us. So you have the experience of sometimes not being able to find words for what you want to say. Or trying some words out and then thinking, that's not right. That's not what I mean. That's not right. Your words let you down. Or you can try saying an ordinary word in Japanese or in English and say the word many times, say it 20 times. The more you say it, the less it seems to be an ordinary word. Say your own name 20 times and you'll think, how is it that I respond when people make that sound? How is it that that sound applies to me? So there's something uncanny, strange, unheimlich in our relation to language. And from that thought, we could also, indeed we will, go into thoughts of translation and the relation between languages, where within language there seems to be an outside that is already partly there within the language we use. So, what is it like to live well with the anxiety of inclusion. You see, we're not thinking that the anxiety of inclusion is something which we can simply overcome. It's not simply a problem to be solved. It's rather something that is internal to our lives, inherent part of our lives. An anxiety about whether I'm in the group or not, what it is to be in the university or not? Because probably if you've paid your fees, technically you're in the university, but if you never come to the university and never open a book, are you in the university? So these things are, are, are disturbing. They're not straightforward questions. And why does this matter? Does it matter? And that's it. I'm just going to say one final thing, and that is that in the UK, in Anglo discourse, in education, inclusion often has a very specific meaning. And the specific meaning is it's to do with whether students, children especially, with special needs, children who are blind or deaf or disabled in some way, whether they should be taught in separate schools or in a common school with normal children. So it's a very specific debate. Are you in favor of including them or keeping them in separate schools? Of course, it's part of this, but that's a particular problem. That's not what this course is about. We're talking about this in much broader terms. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions to Paul? For now, this is the kind of general theme of the course. So. This one. Okay. Yeah, nice. sure, sure. It's about anxiety, which I get a lot of when I'm doing all this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> and as to whether anxiety, the way you presented anxiety is that it seems to be an acknowledgement of, if you like, a, a reality from which we hide or we avoid. Or, but, but often I find when I'm very anxious about things to do, say, with, with the thesis or, or life in general, that the anxiety itself seems to be distorting reality, mm. that I'm not seeing reality. And I'm just sort of interested in to what extent the idea of anxiety picks up on a, a perception of reality or it creates an illusion. Mm. Of well, I want to be clear that the course isn't about anxiety no, in general. Of course, of course, there are many ways in which we become anxious, mm. sometimes with justification. After all, Trump is in power, or will be in power soon. Mm. That's a reason for anxiety. Um, so there are many reasons we can have for anxiousness, mm. and that's not the point. This is the specific thing about our relationship to inclusion, inclusionary and exclusionary practices and ways of thinking, and the particular nerve of disturbance, the, um, the, the, the nerve in the body, as it were, the way this disturbs our mind, our thinking, 
and how that is inevitable in the human condition. So of course, um, I'm admitting the anxiety is there. I don't think we should go neurotic over this anxiety. We need to live with it. We can hide from it by conforming all the time. But that's a failure of human experience, I think. But, but yeah, so the anxiety of inclusion, I'm thinking that's sort of, the, but my next question is, is that includes the possibility both that that anxiety might reflect a, a distortion of how things are. Yes. Or, a, yes, or, a, or a, perhaps a more realistic, yes. accurate mm. perception yes. of how things are. Yes, yes. So, I, I mean, take a very sensitive example. Um, it's not unusual for human beings to go through difficult times with their family and to think, well, do I really belong to this family? Or is there something which doesn't fit here? And you'll never get a complete answer to that. So there's a kind of inevitable uncertainty that goes with that. Does that example work? Or? Yes, mm -hmm. it's that the tension between the sort of subjective sense of yes. how mm -hmm. things are and perhaps a more objective sense of, of how things are. Yes, but I'm wondering if those, that distinction is sustainable. It might not be. Because, of course, the objectivity of the situation depends precisely on our construction of families through the language we use, and that's an ongoing thing. Mm. <coughs> oh, yeah, I, I agree with your opinion that it depends on the objection, uh, objection uh, the, the purposes which yeah. people have for the situation to solve. And my question is that you said about the computer to use about the accuracy. Mm. Yes. Uh, mm. Yeah, you mentioned about that. I think, for example, she uses Mac. But more, almost all the people use Windows, so those machines are totally different. Mm. But then you said that you are using English as a mother tongue. Mm. So I think this kind of difference can be such a difference in, in about the language. For example, some person more recently very increasing number of people use Mac. Mm. So I think, uh, but I'm using Windows. So I think it's different from me. But uh, so the language difference can be machine difference. I, I can say. I can say. OK. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? I probably have half understood what you're saying. There, there's a, I don't know if you'll understand this, but there's a joke in um, uh, the West, let's say, that uh, Mac is Catholic and Windows is Protestant. <laughs> yes. um, well, I think it's because um, Macs are kind of holistic and uh, there's a sort of sensuous quality to them. They're, they're rather nice to look at. You know, you've got nice icons to see and so on. Whereas older versions of Windows used to be very sort of business-like and everything was in a box somewhere or other. Um, do you, you recognise that? I think that's the way it goes. <laughs> so so, so um, Protestantism on the whole is frightened of the body and hides from the body. Catholicism is more accepting of the body. Yeah, but okay. about the uh, uh, comparison, about the comparison, I think the history is different. <laughs> so okay. Catholic has a history, but Mark has no history. Okay. Just more okay. history. But yeah, I... Uh, but, yeah, so you agree with my opinion? Well, uh, there's something much more profound about our connection with language than there is our connection with a specific tool like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be talking about different kinds of car, for example, um, I, I would guess, instead of the computer example. Whereas language is so basic to the human condition, yeah. If you weren't introduced to language when you were uh, a baby, even before you could speak, you came into a language world, then you learned to speak. If that hadn't happened, if you'd been um, abandoned, left alone as a baby, and then looked after by animals and grown up, you would have had animal thoughts, not human thoughts. So yeah. language seems to be generative. It seems to be what creates our thoughts or makes it possible for us to think. Okay, further processing about that point. Uh, for example, computer can be said to be the fundamental tool for modern society. Mm. 
a drug is, can be said to be the fundamental tool for human society. Uh, not, not, not modern, but the, to the, from the past to now. Language is a fundamental tool for us to be uh, in, in the society. Then computer can be said to be the fundamental tool, tool to live in this modern society. Then the difference between the, those two can be smaller and smaller. But you've asserted something, you've said something which I think isn't true because I don't think language is a tool. Now you'll find many textbooks of communications that will tell you it's a tool. You'll find very famous philosophers who say it's a tool. But I don't think that's the case. You know, tools are things that I think about using. Shall I use the hammer or the saw or the computer and so on? But when I do that thinking, I'm already coming from language. Language was there before I ever thought of using a tool. So it's in a quite different position to human being. Yeah. And if you'd never seen a computer or a hammer, you would still be a complete human being. And if you'd never had language, you would be something like an animal or something different. Yeah, but without a computer, we cannot be the modern human. Of course, that's true. <laughs> I know that. Yes, I know. Yes. Shall I just follow up on that? Because um, didn't Heidegger talked about technology, but in a very different way. So. Um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, so I mean, it, I think uh, in terms of computers, we can understand it as a tool, but we can also understand computers as a certain way of thinking as well, can't we? Mm -hmm. And um, for example, when, when you're writing something, it's much easier now. You can mm -hmm. sort of delete words, you can edit what you're saying. If you take a photo of somebody, you can sort of delete the photos that you don't look so good in, and you can. So that there's a kind of there's a, a sort of deeper sense, I think, to technology that we might. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And he said things specifically about computer technology back in the 1950s, mm -hmm. and he thought that the binary coding on which computer technology depends was a profound threat to human mm -hmm. being, worse than the um, nuclear bomb. He said because it could change people so fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm puzzled. I've slipped a slide. There was a, um, before you do, could, could Jay say something? Because Jay was going to, oh, my slide's gone out of sequence. <laughs> no. Oh, my. OK. We have more to say. Yeah, I think there was more to say. But Jay, would you say what you were going to say? And uh, then I, was, then tack well. I was just going to pick up on, on Adrian's point a little bit about anxiety coming into uh, this idea of inclusion. Um, and I was going to bring up the idea that if, if indeed anxiety is inherent to the human condition, is it in some sense, rather than being a, a problem as such, um, could anxiety have an adaptive function? So, so uh, that anxiety serves a purpose. And in particular, if we think about the example that you brought up about the, the, the teenager, do I belong in this family? And that anxiety builds up. Um, could that have a could that serve a purpose, almost at a biological level, um, for you know a, a, as a mechanism by which children move away from their parents and forge their own uh, lives? That's the only that was the point I was going to raise. Um, I want to say uh, about two points. The, the first one is about um, the comparison between the the computer OS and, and the language. I think the, the fundamental difference between this, these two things, I, I, I see there is some way to, to um, uh, there is some, there is some way to see both, uh, both things as, uh, in the, in, as a tool, but I think the difference between these two things is, um, is um, that uh, the computer OS cannot um, modify itself. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, uh, if they are, they are both, we can, if we see that they are, they are tools, and we can modify the, the computer OS in some way, but we cannot um, modify the, the language uh, the way it works in the same way as, 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 as computer OS. Operating system. Uh, yes, it's, a, it's an operating system. I think this, that's, that's a very fundamental difference between the um, between the uh, operating system and, and languages. Mm -hmm. um, and the second point I want to um, 
uh, and to say it's about anxiety. And uh, it's, I think that's where the point of uh, Adrian. And I can quite. I think I can figure out what he was trying to say is about the anxiety of of, of some sort of symbol. I think that's a that's some sort of a, a distortion of, of <coughs> perception of a, of reality. And and. And it's it's quite a um, opposite example of of the um, what uh, so so Heidegger say about anxiety because I think uh, some sometimes people often um, are very anxious about um, what they belong whether they belongs to what they. Um, uh, what class or what, what status in, in social in the uh, uh, what social status they are, and that sort of anxiety about is about the uh, is very symbolic I think, and that's I think is uh, it's a bit different, and I think it's very different from uh, perception of the reality, and mm -hmm. we create some. Um, I think I can say it's some delusion of it yes. about ourselves or about the the society or about the reality, and and, and that's the, the the very example of, if, if the, of the anxiety, anxiety which is not the fundamental um, perception to uh, of our reality. Does it connect with what you're talking about, Jay? Or? Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something? Or Alison wanted to? Is it, oh. done? Is it done? Um, I could say something. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time? We're probably getting short of time. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, I was, just, I was just thinking about how this relates to recognition, and I think it comes up in your paper, so maybe we have more okay. time to talk yes. about it then. Uh, just Can I show that slide? I can't put it on, I'm sorry, could you come? <laughs> okay, this one got missed for some reason, being sh unsure where you are. So, of course, we might think of anxieties of inclusion in relation to alienation. It's a very familiar idea. And this takes multiple forms, uh, dropouts in society. And that's a sociological representation of, uh, of alienation obviously with an Eastern touch to it. I don't know what you think of that. But then hikikomori as a form of alienation. This is a recognized psychological condition in Japan. I think it was recognized, what, 15, 20 years ago or something like that. And it's the uh, withdrawal from society because everything you do seems to go wrong. Confining yourself to your room and communicating by electronic means, let's say. And searching for identity, well, this is a neat. So neat is a more recent term in Japan, and it's actually an adoption of the uh, English acronym, not in education, employment, or training, which has been taken very seriously here by government policy. And this is another thing about identity. This is, these are skin whitening creams, skin whitening creams. And there's a scandal in South Africa because so many skin whitening creams are on the market and many of them are very toxic and people are getting cancer as a result of using these skin whitening creams. Obviously an anxiety about inclusion. And there you've got a development of the species and then the expression of anxiety where the answer that's sought is in the barcodes, which is what we're all becoming. And then, of course, that other aspect of contemporary notions of being inside or outside and of identity in Facebook. So there are reasons, I was going to say, for having doubts about the very notion of identity. Obviously, what Takuo's thesis is about, the very notion of identity and how we relate to that, how we, how we construct that notion and how we uh, submit ourselves to it as well. Okay, I'm sorry about that digression. Perhaps we should go on to the discussion of the thing.